that. You like what you like, I suppose, and that's the wonderful thing about whiskey is that there's a whiskey for everyone. So. Mm-hmm. Do you ever pour yourself a bourbon, swirl it around, and then start struggling to come up with tasting notes? And perhaps you're also looking for a good Father's Day gift idea. Well, you can now solve both with a kit from Nose Your Bourbon. And unlike other nosing kits on the market, Nose Your Bourbon kits feature real ingredients for the most authentic aromas. You can smell real Tahitian vanilla bean instead of some synthetic aroma that's just made from chemicals. So head on over to NoseYourBourbon.com and enter code BP10 for 10% off your order. Ed Bly and Rising Tide Spirits are back again with a new release of Old Stubborn Bourbon. And this release of Old Stubborn is a premium hand marriage of 10, 11, and 12-year cask drink, barely filtered pot still bourbon. It comes in at a staggering 123.8 proof. And the flavoring grain for this one, which the last one was weeded, but this time it's now rye. Rich, sweet, and bold with a long finish that's sure to be another eye-opener. You can order online at Sealbox or TheBourbonConcierge.com, and you can even purchase in person at Revival Vintage Spirits, and even now with very few select stores in Kentucky. You can get it now while you can, but be sure to do it because it's not going to last long. Always find what you love at Total Wine & More. With so many great bottles to choose from at the lowest price, it's easy to find your favorite Cabernet or a new single-barrel bourbon to try with some help from one of their friendly guides. And with every bottle comes the confidence of knowing you just found something amazing. With the lowest prices for over 30 years, find what you love and love what you find only at Total Wine & More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Spirits not sold in Virginia and North Carolina. Drink responsibly and be 21. From their bar to yours, Chad and Sarah of the popular YouTube channel It's Bourbon Night bring you their favorite at-home old-fashioned mix with the new Elemental Elixir's Golden Hour Syrup. It's a custom-made syrup with notes of bold black tea, warm spices, and orange zest. All you need is your favorite whiskey and ice. No bitters needed. One bottle makes 16 drinks, so that's only $1 cocktail before you add your own whiskey. They can also be enjoyed in other cocktails or spirits, mocktails, coffee, tea, and anything you can think of. It's crafted locally in Lexington, Kentucky, and you can get your bottle now at whiskeyambitions.com. Play Whiskey Wednesday Round 11, The Memory Game. Until June 26, each week you can win one of our 12 incredible grand prizes. Select two doors at checkout. And if they match on drawing night, you'll win that bottle. Not a match? No worries. You still score a Weller 12-year. Every $5 ticket gives you five chances to win, including four weekly bonus prizes. Get your tickets now at give270.org. Charitable Gaming License ORG 0002703. Bringing to you the best stories from icons in the bourbon industry, it's Bourbon Pursuit. Now here are your hosts, Ryan and Kenny. And we're back with another episode of the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast. My name is Kenny, and as always, I'm here with my co-host, Ryan. Ryan, how are you doing today? Doing well, sir. Thank you. I'm super excited uh, about today's show. Um, We have you and from Diageo Brands. Uh, Diageo, I really knew nothing about until I met you and started collecting bourbon. And I think the orphan barrels were kind of the first thing that got me interested in Diageo and stuff. So just really interested to talk to you and about, you know, all the orphan barrel products and, you know, blade of bow and what Diageo has uh, upcoming and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think it's really interesting that, that Diageo is, if anybody doesn't know, I mean, Diageo is a massive company. Like it's a, it's a very, very big punk company. Like they're like, they're like the, the Coca-Cola or like the Walmart of spirits, right? I mean, it's, it's huge. And they, they, they haven't always been a bourbon company, but, you know, as of recently, you know, with the acquisition of Bullet, um, with coming out with Orphan Barrels and Blade and Bow, they're, they're definitely showing a, a new sides of themselves. So, I mean, I guess, you know, not only with that, you know, kind of even talking about this past weekend, I did a, uh, I did a tasting and we actually had a few different bottles there. And one, somebody actually brought the, the latest release of Blade and Bow, the, the non-age shaded, like the, the blue one with the key hanging down, you know, the fancy little key dangling down. Which is which is always a good attraction on the on the shelf, and we we had that compared against the forged oak, compared against an E. H. Taylor Bale proof, and you know of course 
they're they're not you know barrel proof compared to the other ones. It had a different different set to it. But when you compared the blade and bow to the forged oak, there was definitely some similarities. And I, I actually kind of preferred the forged oak a little bit over it over the blade and bow. But I mean that that that's always going to be a, a difference in you know where the barrels are sourced from and all those other kind of things that go into it. But you know you don't want to hear this from us. Let's let's talk about the man of the hour here. So today we have Ewan Morgan. Ewan is the the national director for Diageo's Masters of Whiskey. You know I, I think this is pretty cool because uh, uh, he's kind of a man that's almost like in a similar role to mine in a in a day to day business, right? So my role is to be like a an evangelist or an advocate for different kinds of technology, and he gets to be an advocate for whiskey, which I think is uh, sounds like a much cooler gig than what I have. Yeah, yours is lame. So. <laughs> so Ewan, welcome to the show. Hello. Pleased to be here. Hi, guys. How you doing Hello. today, Ewan? You doing all right? I'm doing very well indeed. Good, Thank good, you good. for having me on the show. So you sound like you're from a part of Texas we've never seen before. Yeah, I'm from uh, just outside Austin. <laughs> uh, Austin, no, Massachusetts. I, I'm from, <laughs> I'm, from uh, I'm from an area of Scotland called Speyside. So for those people who like their single malts, they probably recognize that region, and that's where that's where I grew up. But I live here in the United States now. I've lived here for just under five years. Well, good deal. So I guess tell us, you know, your love story with bourbon or maybe whiskeys in general. So so how did you get into this this industry to begin with? Well, I was born into it is the easy answer. So I'm third generation whiskeys. My dad was a, a distillery manager and he, he actually ended up his career working at a distillery called Highland Park. But he worked at Speyside before that in the distillery that I grew up on called Tam Du. And uh, before that, my grandfather, he was actually the brewer at another distillery called Cardew. And Cardew is very famous amongst single malt lovers because it was the first distillery that the, the Walker family of Johnny Walker fame bought in 1893. And it's been a, a key component in their blends ever since. So, yeah, I was, I was born into it. And as I tell people, I didn't really have an option which career path I was going to take. But I think I fell, fell pretty happily into a really nice industry that you know i love well yeah i think now's a good time to be in it more than anything ever right i think it's uh it's 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 definitely flourished to the point where you could you could say that you've you've almost come to like a culmination or a peak in in that in that uh line of work too absolutely i mean especially with american whiskey at the moment i mean we've never seen anything like this certainly certainly not in the years that i've been over here i mean the, the thirst that people have for american whiskey and the knowledge that they have and want is is unprecedented and i've never seen anything like it so i'm sure you guys would agree it's it's, it's phenomenal yeah absolutely so you know our shows we're not we don't i honestly i don't know much about scotches to to even begin with so i guess even on a, on a note of that if you were if you were born into that that kind of that whiskey category, kind of given us an idea of, of what you look at the difference in between uh, bourbons and scotches and other kinds of Irish whiskeys. Well, uh, that that's a really good question, and you have you look at them in the same way. To be honest, I mean, first of all, you look at color, and then you do the aroma, and then you do the taste and the, and the finish, and so on. So in terms of your sensory analysis stuff, it's very similar, but where they do differ is in the way that they're produced. So single malt whiskies in Scotland are only produced from 100% malted barley, as opposed to here in the US, when you look at something like a bourbon, you have to be at least 51% corn in your mash bill, and if you're a rye, you have to be at least 51% rye in there. So you, you guys generally have a a different mash bill, whereas we, us in Scotland, we stick to the one grain, especially with single malts or, or exactly with single malts. But if you're looking at grain whiskies in Scotland, like we produce at Cameron Bridge Distillery, which is a, a huge, huge distillery in Scotland, uh, and where we have a mixture of wheat, wheated whiskies in there as well, and we have whiskies made with maize and corn as well. So we will actually have mash bill whiskies for, for our grain whiskies. But our single malts, are only 100% malted barley. And generally, we only use used casks as well. And most of our used casks come from you guys here in the United States. In fact, more than 90% of the whiskies that we have maturing in Scotland actually come from the United States. So if it wasn't for the bourbon industry, the Scotch industry really couldn't be where it is today either. So there's a wonderful sense of synergy that goes on between the two industries also. Oh, that's great. Awesome. 
So the I only guess, thing I well, sorry. No, nah, go ahead. That. Go ahead, Ryan. The only Irish whiskey I've enjoyed is the red breast. Uh it was pretty good. Everything else seems to taste like a twig to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I think you need to drink more Irish whiskey because there's some amazing Irish whiskeys out there. Obviously, we used to own Bushmills, but it's just recently been taken over by uh, by Cuervo Proximo Brands. But we had Bushmills for, for many years. Uh, but, you know, there's there's wonderful whiskeys out there. Cooley makes some great whiskeys. Uh, Pernod Ricard makes some great whiskeys. Obviously, Red Breast being one of them. So I think I think you need to expand your horizons a little bit and get out of your twig zone. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I will, I will remember those names and look for them. I mean, with, like with anything else, I mean, it's, it's all an acquired taste, right? So there's no way – I mean, I can tell you myself, anybody that drinks bourbon for the first time, they're going to hate it. But after a while, you start liking it. And I think maybe bourbon has that little bit more of a, a beginner's flair to it because it is sweeter. It might be a little bit easier. You know, like scotches, you know, I can't tell you that I ever drink it, right? But people always talk about the peatiness of it, right? And uh, it's definitely a little bit more bitter to it. But I think any way you go, it's definitely going to be an acquired taste. Uh, yeah, no, and everyone's palate is different. And as you go around the world, you will see that people's palates differ country by country. So, for example, here in the United States, in general, you guys have a much sweeter palate than we do in Europe. And if you go further up into Scandinavia, they go for a much more uh, smoky, more aggressive flavor profile. So, I mean, it's not just person by person. I mean, different countries have their own flavor profiles as well. Uh, but I mean, going going back to Scotch, um, because I'm from Scotland. Not all Scotches are smoky. I mean, you can get very light, very sweet Scotches, uh, but you can also conversely get very, very heavy, very peaty, smoky ones. And they're the ones that generally polarize people. You either like them or you don't. But back to bourbon. I mean, bourbon is very accessible because of that that sweetness. And if you're taking like a, something or an 80 proof bourbon and you're mixing it up in like a julep or you're putting it into a cocktail or like something like a buck with ginger beer and fruit, then, you know, that's a drink that anyone can enjoy. Anyone of legal drinking age, I hasten to add. And, <laughs> uh, you know, even my wife who doesn't like whiskey at all, she can drink bourbon cocktails. Whereas if I offered her a scotch cocktail, she would probably... Uh, not be so keen on that idea. Well, good. Well, she can come hang out with us then. Yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. I'll, I'll, pass, <laughs> I'll, I'll pass on your kind offer. <laughs> so let's talk about uh, your role at Diageo. So tell us what a, what a master of whiskey does. A master of whiskey, uh, again, as I was telling you earlier, a slightly auspicious title is actually an earned title. And uh, we're the only ambassador program out there where you actually have to earn that title. And that goes through various dis different stipulations and checkpoints where they have to pass industry exams. They have to do internships at distilleries, not just in Scotland, but here in the United States. They have written exams to do as well. And, and it takes roughly about a year to a year and a half for them to go through all of these different parts of the process in order for them to become a master of whiskey. But their day-to-day -day job, is education. They're out there all over the country talking about whiskey, educating bartenders, talking to consumers, doing dinners, uh, work as well as self-educating themselves at the same time. So it's it's a full-time job and it's 100% whiskey. That's all they talk about and that's pretty much all they want to talk about as well. We find a very unique breed of people who are uh, obsessive about whiskey and they want that to be their career. So I guess how would you get started in, a, in something like that? I mean, is it just like I can look on uh, you know, LinkedIn or any kind of job board for a, a master of whiskey kind of uh, role? I mean, like, do you have to kind of have your, your beginnings in a, in a distillery somewhere and then you start looking at the paperwork of taking all those exams? Um, no. Uh, and in fact, if you looked at our current roster, we have we have a wide gamut of talent. So we have people who've come from the bartending community. We have people who've worked previously in distilleries. We have people who've worked within distributors. Uh, we've had we even have a ex Hollywood movie stuntman at the moment who's one of our masters of whiskey. And it's really the raw passion that we're looking for. So if they have the passion for it and they can handle the extremely long antisocial hours and extensive travel, 
then we will take them on and then we will train them up and we will get them up to a level that, that we're comfortable with that we can we can let them out there and they can start doing their own seminars and we have our ambassadors who cover things like Tales of the Cocktail in New Orleans every year and we send them down there and they do seminars on rye and we're doing ones on MGP LDI coming up. Uh, so yeah, no, they're they're a very different breed and they're extremely hardworking and they're out there all the time just talking about whiskey and preaching the good word. So now that we kind of hit on a little bit earlier about how Diageo is starting to, you know, turn a turn a new leaf and start showing bourbon as a as a, one of their flagship brands, uh, kind of talk about maybe a little bit how Diageo started getting into bourbon when uh, it had all these other whiskey brands that weren't necessarily uh, categorized as bourbon. So they to to get into it in its purest sense, they got into it when they acquired part of Seagram's and with that acquisition of that part of Seagram's came Bullet Bourbon with it. So that that was really their first foray and their first step into North American whiskey, although they own Grand Royal as well. That's deemed as a Canadian whiskey. Their first bourbons that they were taking in and, and marketing and selling was Bullet. And it kind of really kind of moved on from there. I mean, Bullet was a fairly small brand when Diageo acquired it. And now you see Bullet everywhere. Uh, it's the best selling rye in the world. It's in every bar that you go into. So the success of Bullet has, has really been a great springboard for us which has then moved us on in recent years into the more of the innovation stuff that we've seen coming through, specifically with the Orphan Barrel project and also with the upcoming Blade and Bow projects as well. So we're, we're just starting to get really, really serious about our, our bourbon expansion and obviously we're putting a sizable investment into the, the Shelby County distillery, $115 million that are going into there. That's going to be the, the new distilling home of Bullet Bourbon as well. So Tiaggi are definitely back in the game in terms of, of bourbon. Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. Shopify's point of sale is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. And with Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers in line and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. And get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point of sale system, or use Shopify's point of sale Go Mobile device for a battle tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award winning 24 7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash bourbon, all lowercase, and go to shopify.com slash bourbon to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash bourbon. If you're anything like me, then you can't get enough about bourbon. And that's why I'm a subscriber to Bourbon Plus magazine. Bourbon Plus is a quarterly publication that tells the stories from the heart of bourbon, the farmers who grow the grain, the distillers who labor over the process, and the people like you and me who raise their glasses to celebrate it all. Subscribe to Bourbon Plus Magazine today at bourbonplus.com, that's P-L-U-S dot com, and use code PURSUIT at checkout for $5 off your subscription. So you, you mentioned the Orphan Barrel. So let's go ahead and uh, talk about that a little bit. You know, I'm pretty sure all of our listeners are, are very familiar with the Orphan Barrel, uh, the series or the brand or whatever you want to call it. So I guess, can you give us a little bit of history on on how that particular line uh, started and maybe where the inspiration came from? Well, the inspiration for it came from our people who were working at Stitzel Weller who were walking around our warehouses, scratching their heads, looking at how much whiskey we had on site there. And we only had a limited amount of projects that they were assigned to. Obviously, we had I.W. Harper going to Asia 
uh, and we had the Bullet project going, but we had all this other liquid, and we were looking at it, and some of this liquid was getting pretty old. I mean, Old Blowhard, for example, was 26 years old at that point. And if we'd left that one another year, then we don't really know what we would have done with it. We certainly couldn't release it as a as a bottling. It would have had to have been mingled into something else. So it, it came born of frustration more than anything else. And <laughs> and we were talking to the people and at Stitzel, and they're like, you know what? We need to release this stuff. This liquid is great. We need to find a way of getting this out into market so people can taste it before it gets too old. So the the folks at Diageo sat down and they, they came up with the Orphan Barrel Whiskey Project, which was a great vehicle for us to release this liquid into the market and release it at a great price point as well, I hasten to add. So all of the Orphan Barrels that we've released have been at a very reasonable price point. And we only we can only suggest pricing, but they're all supposed to go in there and they're all supposed to go to whiskey accounts that really love whiskey and retailers who really love whiskey. And those folks who can then pass it on to the adoring public. And, you know, the reception that we had to begin with was one more of bemusement, which is kind of transferred into that one of, of excitement. And each release that we, we have coming out now, people can't wait to get their hands on them. And uh, I, th- I think it's it's a telling sign that not only is bourbon back, but serious bourbon drinking is back as well. Yeah, I think you're right when you say that because anything that, that has a, an age statement or anything that is even higher than, say, 12 years, that stuff just happens to fly off the shelf. So, you know, I guess it, it's also kind of coming back to uh, maybe it's a shelf trophy if I've got a, a 22 or a 26 year old bourbon or something like that. But uh, at the same time, this is something that a lot of people really want to own now. They, they want these higher end brands and, and not just something that's uh, a non age dated you know like two to four or six year bourbon that's that's all kind of mixed together so i think that's that's one of the biggest attractions to this orphan barrel line anyway yeah and, and what i would say is you also get fantastic non-age statement whiskeys and uh, so there, there's not nothing against them at all but i mean the fact that we had this older liquid there and it had great flavor profile great character and then we had this new project that we were able to release them out for people to taste was extremely exciting for, for not just me, but everyone who was working on this project. And so, yeah, not, not really like the artwork of each bottle. They're really cool and different from anything you see out there. How did you all, who designed those and how did you all come up with those designs? So we uh, employed an agency in New York called Raison d'Etre and they're extremely artistic agency. And, and you can see that from all the bottlings. They all have their own unique style. And, and the ones that have the animals on them, like if you see the animals, that's supposed to, to represent the, the spirit animal that's within the bottle. So with, with Barter House, you have that kind of crafty fox there. And then Old Blowheart was the whale because it, it was a big, big whiskey. And then you go through to things like uh, Lost Prophet and you have the sheep on there as a, the lost sheep. So it's all kind of supposed to signify the, the story of, of the spirit animal within the liquid. Whether you want you to get that so esoteric, but no, people love the packaging, and the one I'm, I really like at the moment is the rhetoric, and you know that's going to be a progressively aged bourbon, and as each one gets released, there's like a wooden veneer on that label, and that that veneer will get darker as they progress. So each one will look different as it progresses, and the liquid within it will also be getting darker, obviously with those additional years of maturation. Well, that's fantastic to know because uh, the first ret- rhetoric was, was it 20 years? Is that what it was? It, yep, it was 20 years. 20 years. And 90 and, proof. Yeah, and then the new one actually just started hitting shelves and it's the 21 year. That makes makes sense now. Yep, yep. And if you put them side by side, you will see a slight difference in the color of, of that veneer. And the next one will be darker and so on and so forth until we get up to the 25 year. And then by that point, that will be it. We should have no more rhetoric. Wow, how about that? So let's let's talk about some of these individual releases. You know, let's, we don't have to go into all of them because we could probably spend two episodes going into each one. But you know, so there's there's a few different orphan barrel releases. There's Old Blowhard. There's Barter House, Lost Prophet, Rhetoric, and Forged Oak. And, mm-hmm. and I, I don't think I'm missing one. But talk a little bit about you know maybe each one individually, just a little bit to kind of 
uh, a small backstory or, or kind of uh, what makes that one unique compared to the next one? Sure thing. So we'll we'll start at the beginning. So the first two releases were Barter House and Old Blowhard. Uh, Barter House came from the new Bernheim distillery, whereas Old Blowhard came from the old Bernheim distillery. I think it was an '87 distillate. The old, in fact, Old Blowhard was the highest proof that we pulled out of the whole project. And if our memory serves, I think it was 148.7 ABV that we pulled that one out at. Uh, sorry, 148.7 proof that we pulled that one out. So it was very high proof. Um, 26-year-old came out at 90.7 proof once we'd taken it down to, to bottling strength. And again, that was, that was a big, big oak bomb of a whiskey, very rich, also had a nice peppery note towards the back of it. Uh, and it was one of those ones, it was it was like smoky whiskey. You you either loved it or, or it was a little bit too oaky for you. And we've had people who've been obsessive about it. Uh, and that was a one-time release, so you will never see Old Blowhard again. So if you do have a bottle, uh, either drink it with caution uh, <laughs> or, or hold on to it because we're seeing that one going for crazy prices in the aftermarket already. Maybe that's why um, you don't share with all your friends on day one. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. Uh, Barter House was a 20-year-old that came from New Bernheim. Uh, mash bill on both of those actually was 86 corn, 8 barley, and 6 rye. So high corn. Uh, and a nice nice amount of that right add just a little bit of pepper to it. And with that one, we were looking at a little bit more of a sweeter, more cereal note. And then we moved into rhetoric, which was uh, the progressively aged, as I just said. And that was a mixture of both new and old Bernheim liquid that were in there. So we'll say the same mash bill coming through. Um, and we had a real great following on that one. People really loved it. It had a bit more of a kind of spicy cedar note to it. And then we moved into my favorite to date, which was Lost Profit, which was a 22-year-old 90.1 proof, which came through. And then the, the mash bill on that one was uh, roughly 78% corn, 10% barley, and then 15% rye. So a high rye mash bill on that one. And that's possibly why I like it. I like a little bit of pepper and spice to it. But it had a wonderful kind of caramel note to it as well, nice toffee flavors. And then Forged Oak, which you guys were mentioning earlier on, which uh, is another new Bernheim at 15 years old. So this is the youngest one to date. Again, with that eighty-six percent high corn in there, so a nice, a nice sweet drive, but also a good amount of that oak and a good amount of those lactones, like some coconut flavors, and there's also that nice oaky vanilla flavor coming through there as well. So they're, they're all very different, and uh, the next ones that are coming through as well. In fact, after Rhetoric Twenty One, the one after that is my new favorite, and I can't tell you anything about it other than it's delicious. Oh, oh, come yeah. on. Yeah, I know. You think we were going to get some good information. We're like, we're going to blow up after this. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you it's a straight bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> I guess and we'll take it. And it's going to be in a bottle, and it will probably have an animal on it. Well. So that, that's all you're getting. <laughs> we'll take uh, it. Yeah, we'll, we'll see if we can sell that information to Vanity Fair or something. <laughs> So, you know, you talked about, you know, old blowhard being, you know, that, that bottling was the last of it. Like there's never going to be any of it again. So with the releases that are out, um, you know, you talked about rhetoric having a five year lifespan and after that it's all gone. What about, you know, um, barter house and lost profit and forged oak? Because I think what I've seen already is that some new barter houses, some new batches are starting to slowly show up on the market. Yep. Yep. So you're seeing batch two of barter house. Uh, you will probably also see a, a more batches of forged oak coming through. But as regards lost profit, that's another one that if you have a bottle of it, then then treat it with the respect it deserves because you're never going to see it again because it's all gone. Um, but back to Barter House and, and forged oak, yep, you're going to see second batches of forged oak and we are already seeing the second batches of Barter House out in market as well. Uh, and we do not have a finite resource on this liquid as well. So I actually do not know how many batches they will be getting through from it. Um, we will have other releases coming, but I cannot tell you how many. Yeah, I mean, so that's that's really awesome to know because 
you know, we, we talked to a lot of people and of course anybody ever asks you, they say, they, they show you a bottle and they say, uh, is this a good bourbon? You know, can, can I still get it? You know, when I go back home or something like that. And, you know, when they, whenever I get a picture and they show me any kind of orphan barrel, it's, it's always hard to know because there's this, this whole thing of like, well, was it really marketing to say it's an orphan barrel? Then that's, that's it. Like it'll never be found again. But, but now we've heard the truth that there's actually two different versions that, you know, this is it. Like it's, it's done for. And now that we know that eventually the rest of these batches will, will run out too. So, um, they, they will dry up at some point. Yeah. Everything dries up at some point. Um, but what, going back to what I was saying with, uh, old Blowheart and lost profit, we get asked about those a lot if we're going to be having other releases of them and we are not, there is no more juice left at all. Well, that's great to know. Interesting. So if you probably had a chance to try them all. So can you tell us, like, maybe, I guess you kind of already talked about your favorite of being Forged Oak. I guess, can you talk about maybe some of the notes in the new one that, that is your new favorite? No, Lost Profit is my favorite. Oh, Lost Profit. See, I, see, I kind of retention span and that I have. <laughs> but you're not, you're not supposed to have a favorite kid, even if they are an orphan. So I don't know. <laughs> it's... Uh, <laughs> But the the new one that I can't really tell you about, uh, the the flavor profile on it is extremely unique and you're just going to have to wait and see. And I can't wait for it to come out because the, the backstory behind it is, is great and the liquid is even better. It's phenomenal. Well, good. So well, since we have a we have that to anticipate, now there is actually another release that has already hit stores and already hit shelves and there's already pictures of it and people always asking questions of uh, is this another Orphan Barrel release or is this uh, just going to be something that we're always going to be able to find on the shelves. So let's talk a little bit about Blade and Bow. I know that there's two different releases, so can you kind of talk about the differences between them? Sure thing. So there's going to be a base release – which is going to be a Solera system-driven liquid, which we can talk about a little bit in a minute. And then there's also going to be a limited edition 22-year-old release as well. So this is another one that we only have a small amount of liquid for. Uh, obviously, for those people who keep their eyes on the, the awards and stuff, it was just offered, awarded double gold in San Francisco as best straight bourbon. And uh, talking to my friend Fred Minnick the other day, he was he couldn't stop talking about it. He he loves the stuff, so that's going to be one. If you do see it on the shelves, make sure you pick up a bottle. Uh, both priced very very competitively as well. Again, we can only suggest pricing, but we're looking at roughly about fifty bucks for the for the base, and then about one hundred and forty nine for the twenty two year old. Yeah, so I also I guess let's talk about that Solera aging. What what is that to to all of us noobs that are just drinking it and not really understanding the process that goes behind it? So, uh in order to explain it over the phone is probably not not ideal without a picture, <laughs> but it's similar in fact it's it's very similar to what they do in the rum industry. So, for example, if you go to Ronza Kappa, they have a Solera aging system there. Um, and what they're doing is they have at, at Stitzel, they have these five different levels, so five different layers of barrels. And what they're doing is they're taking the youngest liquid and then that will go into the top barrel and then that will slowly move down. So there's always going to be a constant mix going into the level below it. And there's also going to be in there, there's also going to be some of the last distillate from Stitzel as well. So I think 91, 92 distillate is going to be in there. So for every bottle of the base that you buy, there's going to be a little bit of original Stitzel Weller liquid in it. So it's a, it's a fairly complex way of making sure that you're, you're mixing both young and old liquid together. So you're getting a kind of a juxtaposition of flavor going on. And I don't know if you guys have had a chance to taste it yet, but it's delicious. I did actually get a chance to taste the uh, the base. I had the one younger past, one. Yeah, I had a base one this past weekend. It was very good. It was yeah. very good. And again, and the so price there's point. old Stitzel in that younger one too. Yep, in every bottle. Oh, cool, awesome. 
so this, I'll talk us talk about like the marketing behind it because it, you show up and it was a we went to a tasting this weekend and somebody showed up with the bottle and it's got this this fancy little key dangling from it. So what's what's the significance of the key and uh, the blade and bow name in general? Uh, so blade and bow are named after two different parts of a skeleton key. So the blade is the the shaft. And the ornate bow handle is is the is the other part is the bow. So these five keys, if you go to stitch, so you will see them hanging up there at the front, and they're supposed to symbolize the five steps of crafting bourbon: so grain, yeast, fermentation, fermentation, distillation, and aging. Um, and also, these keys were supposed to symbolize this kind of great Southern tradition of hospitality and warmth and enjoying the finer things in life. So if you pop along to Stitzel, you'll, you'll see them hang in there. Well, it's good to know. And then now, some of the, our listeners may not know, you know, I guess if you're, if, you've into, if you're into bourbon and maybe you've never heard of Stitzel Weller. Stitzel Weller is a name that uh, is, is something that's always thrown around. It has a very, very rich history in the bourbon industry. It's what made Pappy Van Winkle, Pappy Van Winkle, and it's what people go crazy for. And now Diageo um, – has made Stitzel Weller their new home. It's it's where the the Bullet Frontier experience is, and I guess you know to you and maybe you can speak on on half of Diageo. You know what does it mean to call Old Stitzel Weller uh, that distillery your home now? Well, it, we've had it for for quite some time. You know, since it closed in in ninety two, and then Diageo came along in nineteen ninety seven. So Diageo have had it as a warehousing facility, albeit not an operating distillery, since 97. So we've had a lot of liquid stored there. We've also been doing some innovation products there, um, as well as IW Harper was all mingled there before being sent out to Asia as well. So it's always been people on site, although not making whiskey. But, you know, we now have a craft distillery operational on site, uh, at Stitzel Weller. And, you know, it's really wonderful that we, we have this great place, that all of this history is there, you know, all of the stories that go along with it. When people come, it's almost like they're they're coming to church. People have these kind of bourbon epiphanies <laughs> when they walk in and people have different reactions. And, you know, it's it's just wonderful to have this, this facility and we're going to be doing like training courses there as well, as well as the fact that we have all the orphan barrel stuff going on there and, and the bullet bottling line is there and the, the blade and bow is all being bottled there as well. So it, it's gone from being a fairly, fairly quiet place um, to a place that's now actually busy, you know, and there's a lot of bourbon coming out of there and we're getting a lot of visitors through the door as well. So, you know, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, I, I could, could be happier. Yeah, I could totally see that as uh, you need to put like a, a bowl out there with some bourbon in it and people can dip their two fingers in it and do the sign of the cross as they first enter if you're going <laughs> to call it the church. It's like yeah. going to the realm of bourbon. <laughs> Just, it's a weller. <laughs> well, that exactly, you know, and and back to what you guys were saying, you know, people have such a, a voracious appetite for anything bourbon at the moment and to give them an opportunity to come and see where these iconic brands were created, you know, like like the Van Winkle family who had it for many years. Uh, and then obviously you go way back and you look at things like George Dickel was made there for a while. And, you know, there's, there's some great, great stories that come out of that place and, you know, having a, a rare opportunity to visit somewhere like that here in the United States is is phenomenal. Well, thank you very much, Ewan, for being on the show today. We're, we're getting to that, that top of that 30-minute mark, and I uh, definitely wanted to say thank you for coming on here, uh, representing Diageo, and talking <sighs> about the orphan burial process and the releases, and hopefully we can have you on the show a little bit later on and talk about later releases that, that will be coming out as well. I'd be happy to. Is that it? I could talk for like another two hours if you want. I can, we can keep on trucking. I'll give you 30 <laughs> seconds. Go. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to ask me a question. What do you want to know? <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. How um, much Stitzel Weller juice do you have on hand? Uh-oh. There we go. Here in my office, I have two <laughs> liters. I'm looking at two liters of it in front of me right now. 
that's all I can. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> I hear you. <that. laughs> there we go. All right. Well, thank you very much again, Ewan. If you like what you hear, make sure you subscribe to us on iTunes. You can find us if you go to it and just type in Bourbon Pursuit. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Bourbon Pursuit, uh, and also follow us on Twitter at Bourbon Pursuit. Yeah, thanks, Ewan. Again, that was really awesome and interesting. And uh, if you guys have any suggestions or feedback, let us know. And uh, we'll see you next time.